Well, okay, it's a little precarious up here on these pedestals, but welcome or welcome back to the channel for yet another video about furniture from the past. And so I hope that today's video will preserve a digital trace of this 330-year-old artifact and that no matter your degree of experience, that taking a closer look will interest you, if not perhaps inform your own collecting. And so I do hope as well, though, that through the discussion of these pre-industrial period pieces from an early original timeline in furniture history spanning from the Renaissance, the 1500s to 1840, I hope that through these videos I will shed some light on furniture history and help people understand the difference between these original, very collectible, beautiful pieces and everything else that we sort of generally, ambiguously qualify as an antique. And so this specific piece takes us back to the 17th century, really to the late 17th century. It might even date from the early 18th century, but let's just consider this one as something that dates from the 1690s, which for Americans is the time of the Salem witch trials. For the French, it's the time of the Three Musketeers. Maybe a little bit late for that, but you get my drift. This is from a world that is very different than the one we know today. In the 1690s, dentists did not exist yet. Chicken eggs were considered caviar. Life expectancy was 25. And people didn't wash themselves very much because germ theory was that sicknesses entered the body through the pores via water. Am I missing anything? Well, in terms of furniture history, what's so interesting about French furniture from the 17th or the 18th century, regional masterpieces like this, is that we're going to perceive a major difference stylistically between all these different regions. And so just to express how different France was then from what we know of the country now, back in the 1690s, these different regions, which left such special and unique marks on furniture history, they were actually speaking different dialects of, of French. And so we see the styles are sort of consistent with the fact that these different regions in France were in fact linguistically differentiated as well. So anyway, with the context set to appreciate this piece, I'll begin by saying that the first and most interesting part of it, to me, is the presence of an antique dealer's label on the inside of this drawer. Now, of course, this is an important label that's very interesting, so it's exactly the only thing that's been rubbed off. But we can still read the word antiquaire here in French, which just means antique dealer, and part of a date which appears to be some day of some month in 1908. We'll also appreciate some of this very rudimentary joinery, which is common for the hidden and functional parts of a period piece. We also see how these joints have shrunk. But anyway, I think the point here is that this label suggests how this piece has been appreciated and dealt as a real venerable piece of the past for longer than most antiques have even been around. And so, as collectors, furniture enthusiasts, first and foremost, we appreciate pieces like this as presentation pieces, with the word armoire coming from the Latin armarium, meaning the place where the arms are kept. And this etymology really just helps us understand these pieces as centerpieces of the home, which would have been used to present silverware or finery. In any case, these grand 18th century models, or in this case, late 17th century models, they're not something that's necessarily relegated to a dark bedroom for clothing storage. And now in collecting these armoires, the key is to not be swept away by the impressive size of all armoires, but rather to look into the details of true artistic value that are really only present in an absolute minority of late 17th or 18th century grand models of armoires. And so this one we first see is an armoire à trois corps, which means it's a three-bodied armoire built in three tiers with the cornice being so grand that it is in fact a tier of the piece. But this piece had to be built in such a way because otherwise it would truly be immovable. And these different pieces don't really make it very portable, but they at least facilitate its initial installation somewhere. And so this particular example of an armoire is really emblematic of southwestern France, of the finest furniture produced there during the final quarter of the 17th century and the first quarter of the 18th century, specifically the region of Périgueux or Quercy. And we see how this model is equivalent to several ones which are published in the 1970s here and which may even have been issued from the same workshop. 
Now, more interestingly and more monumentally, this armoire is equivalent to one which is conserved in the Chateau de Montbazillac and which is classified a French historic monument. And we see here how on both of these armoires, we're dealing with this quintessential southwestern French large format armoire with an incredibly wide cornice and with majestic bun feet, which are sometimes referred to as cheese wheel feet. And so here we really have an example of how furniture is the expression of permanence in a society. This is really not going anywhere. We'll notice that furniture becomes heavier and larger the farther society moves away from the Middle Ages, when of course life was belligerent and transient, and of course no one had furniture like this because, you know, they weren't living in a permanent fashion. But anyway, we see here that we just have an absolutely thorough and very developed expression of this imposing Louis XIV style with these powerful moldings, this elaborate cornice that doesn't just deploy in one or two architectural moldings, but which literally deploys in 20. I might be the only person who's ever counted that. But we have 20 moldings up there. We have the typical bun feet of late 17th century furniture, but here they've really been pushed to their limit of what we could imagine, you know, such exaggerated dimensions. And that's why these feet are sometimes referred to as cheese wheel feet. Now, part of the reason why we see such a memorable and impressive example of Louis XIV regional furniture here is that Périgueur is quite isolated as a region, and so it took a long time for this southwestern French region to receive the later Parisian Louis XV and Louis XVI styles. It's always interesting to have an emblematic armoire from a particular region that really showcases the height of art and style of a given region. But here, you know, this is kind of the model par excellence of a Louis XIV piece, simply because this imposing, massive, dominating Louis XIV style was pushed to sort of its upper limits of quality and development in this particular region. So this particular armoire really stands out for the complexity of its moldings, the depth here, and just the number of imbrications, the amount of work that was involved in making them that we see upon closer inspection. And it's the complexity of the moldings that we really look at to differentiate in terms of quality between all examples of this sort of overwhelming model. When we come up close, we're going to be able to tell if one is truly refined and very memorable, or if one is just kind of large and impressive at a distance. Now on this particular one, it's nice to see that the shape of these Louis XIV panels here, which we associate with late 17th century furniture production, this is a panel design that replaces the diamond point, the geometric diamond point, which happens earlier more, more commonly. It's associated with earlier on in the century. But here on this one, we see this final quarter of the 17th century panel design, and we see that this panel has been completed at the bottom of the doors, whereas on the Montbaziac example, which is a French historic monument, we'll, we'll notice that they just left the bottom of the door blank. Also, on the Montbaziac example, the sides of that armoire are paneled differently than the fronts, and I actually enjoy how this one repeats the identical panel that we're going to see on the front of the doors on the sides, and that just adds a really nice continuity to this piece visually when we approach it from the sides. Now, one of my favorite aspects of the piece is that there really was no skimping on the quantity of the wood that was used. That's very apparent as we look at these massive and powerful large moldings. Even the small moldings are what would be considered large format moldings on most pieces. And as I mentioned, we see the complexity of the moldings here, these, these moldings that differentiate this piece from, let's say, a less artistic example of this exact model. But we see that complexity there again in the upper cornice with some of the moldings designed to form triangle shapes at the corners of the piece, which accentuate the corners, and which also mark the center of the piece. And then interestingly, these triangle moldings are repeated naturally at the base, so that there's a balance between the top and the bottom. And so then, subtly, we see that these triangles that we find at the top and at the bottom are also repeated here on this smaller molding that marks the division between the bottom tier and the middle tier. And if we pan over this as well, we're going to see that this molding is itself very much imbricated with, with one, two, three, four, five, six, six lips at the top, which wrap around to a few even underneath it. And that's nice to see that they went ahead and continued to work the underside of this molding as if anyone is ever going to see it.
we see that there's a real complexity and a real refinement to the parts of what might just strike us as something that's obnoxiously large, even though this is a piece that really plays on its size and imposing architecture, that's where a lot of its artistic value comes, comes from, as collectors, we have to look full circle and say, well, it's certainly achieving its purpose at a glance. Does it live up to a little bit of up close scrutiny? And this one certainly does. Now, the next thing that we're going to see kind of as an outstanding feature here is the metalwork. And that's known in furniture from southwestern France, where in the midst of these very impressive walnut pieces, we're going to see some refined, almost precious little touches of metalwork that do not detract from the woodwork here, which is really the star of the show. But nevertheless, there's a real refinement, there's a beauty to these hinges, to the finely sculpted keyhole entry plates in the form of acanthus leaves, and even to these larger drawer pulls here. If we open the piece, and we look at all of my old books in there, we'll actually notice on the inner doors that the hinges are numbered. This is hinge number three, this is hinge number four. And if we take the doors off of their hinges, if I lift this door off, we're going to see that the male and female parts of each hinge group are themselves numbered, simply because these hinges are hand forged and they only correspond to one another. Because you can't use this hinge with that one if they got mixed up. And so that's just part of the reality of how things used to be made by hand and therefore they were all slightly different. Anyway, something that we wouldn't necessarily think about. We're going to see that it is lined, at least on the shelves, with a toile de jouis, which is a type of printed fabric that's pretty common inside of these old pieces. I've ripped most of that out in my cleaning process. But we also see that the inner doors are not nearly as polished as the outside, but they are smoothed, they are finished, and there are large holes here, probably left from the candelabra, that used to be mounted inside of this armoire. And I think you can imagine how impressive that would be to have this full of, you know, silverware, probably not a bunch of old books, but to have it full of silverware, interesting things, and to leave these doors open with massive steel candelabra, uh, which would have been illuminating this from across a very grand room. So, with all of that being said, and the day coming to a close, the last thing we're going to do here is just pan over the back of the piece, which is in fact left very rough. And we're going to see these hand saw marks, a little bit of woodworm attack, the apparent dowels, very heavy oxidation, which is expected for something that's 330 years old. But this is one of the first things we do in trying to apprehend whether or not the piece in question is from the original pre-industrial period. As one of the hallmarks of pre-industrial period pieces is that the hidden, functional, especially the back parts of the piece, would be left sort of rough as finishing the fronts and making these pieces so beautiful took so much time that, and effort that, well, they didn't go to that trouble to finish the backs. And then we might even take a look at the top of the cornice because to my recollection when I was putting this together, the top of the cornice was extremely dans son jus, as the French say, which is in its own juice, meaning it's, it's basically at its natural. It hasn't been dusted in 300 years up there. <laughs> And so, you know, that's just one of the basic things that we do when apprehending whether a piece is from the period or not, is that we look at the hidden parts of the piece and we say, well, have these been machined? And so, again, this is just part of the quick little checklist that we run through to make sure that a piece is from the period in question. It's not at all conclusive, but luckily for us, a piece like this was never faked simply because the primary materials used here and the skill it took to build this and the price that these have always traded at has never really prompted any forgery. Sometimes these grand models were reproduced after the fact, after the original period, by a very small group of very, very talented furniture makers. But running across one of those reproductions would be pretty rare. And running through a checklist like this, uh, which shows that the backs are oxidized. There's many different centuries, different decades of woodworm attack of different species. We see here on this piece that in all likelihood we're not dealing with a later copy by an obscure expert who would have endeavored to reproduce one of these. We're dealing with an original 17th century piece from southwestern France. So anyway, with all of that being said, I do hope that you've enjoyed taking a closer look at this pretty remarkable and emblematic trace of the history of southwestern France circa 1700.
Now, I'll add and I'll end with the fact that I rescued this piece or I adopted it from an old antique dealer in Bordeaux who passed away. He was in his 90s and I can say after spending the three weeks that it took me to kind of clean and revive this and get it back into a pretty presentable state, I can see why an elderly man in his 90s in fact had this on the back burner for many, many years. Even opening a door, opening the drawer is kind of a strenuous thing. But with all that being said, I thank you very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed taking a closer look. And please like the videos and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to support the endeavor of creating an online period furniture library of the most compelling pieces that I encounter. Thank you. Mm -hmm.